Here I'll teach you everything you need to know to start seriously learning string theory. It is not as hard as people make it sound. Imagine you are in your bedroom and you want to measure your door. After measuring it, you find out that it is two meters high. But what does that actually mean? What does it mean to say that something is two meters long? The definition of a meter was established in the 17th century, but its intention originates back to the 16th century during the scientific revolution, started, even if not on purpose, by Nicholas Copernicus. Interestingly, the meter is defined based on the definition of another physical quantity, the second. Similarly, cesium is a chemical element. When it is in its lowest energy level, namely the ground state, any small input of energy can excite it to the second lowest energetic state. It can also easily lose energy, going back to the lowest state again. The photon emitted, or absorbed, has a specific frequency, around 9 billion per second. But what does a second actually mean? Well, once we know the frequency of these photons, we can define one second as the time that passes after around 9 billion periods of the radiation. That's a very precise number. And that's the point I'm trying to make. From such a solid definition of a second, the meter can be established. And then, only then, you can confidently measure your door. The speed of light in vacuum, which is a constant of the universe, is something that does not change and is measured to be around 300 million meters per second. So, in one second, light moves around 300 million meters away from its original position. And therefore, one meter is defined as how far a particle of light moves after this tiny number of a second. That's a very precise number, but here is the catch. Even though their definitions are very clear and dependent on natural observations, like atomic events and the speed of light, at the end of the day, they are just human constructions to help us in our everyday life. There's nothing fundamental about the definitions of second and meter. If tomorrow we find out that another physical element provides a more accurate measurement process of time, these definitions would be thrown out the window. So they are not fundamental. Remember this word. This measurement problem has everything to do with string theory. If you're enjoying this video, do not forget to like and subscribe. The theory basically assumes that every piece of matter in the universe is made up of tiny strings that, according to their specific vibration modes, define one particle or another. As you may have heard, string theory is one of our best candidates to combine Einstein's general theory of relativity with quantum mechanics, or at least that's what its propellers repeat to themselves every single morning while they look in the mirror. Broadly speaking, we can consider general relativity as a description of physical events in large scales, like interactions between planets and galaxies, while quantum mechanics is concerned with very small scales, like the behavior of electrons and quarks. However, there are some physical events that are impossible to describe without considering both quantum and relativistic effects simultaneously. Examples are the interior of black holes and the first instance after the Big Bang. And it is exactly there that the contradictions start to appear. Mathematically speaking, the greatest contradictions take place when trying to describe events using both general relativity and quantum mechanics. These are infinities in the calculations. These infinities have no physical meaning. In simple words, string theory makes a series of assumptions about our universe that, if one day are proven to be true experimentally, will get rid of all the infinities in the calculations and all the contradictions between the two greatest theories in the history of physics and will be promoted to the status of the unified theory. But the gap between theoretical predictions and empirical proof is a huge one, and string theories so far are not even close to overcoming it. This is extremely simplified, of course, but by the end of this video, I guarantee you that you will have a much better grasp of string theory and therefore will be much better off than 99.999% of the world's population who never really learned these concepts about string theory. And I can assure you that there is no content like that on YouTube to date. In order to appreciate the fundamentals of measurement, imagine we could rescale a typical football game to a scenario where players are as tall as skyscrapers. While the fundamental laws of motion and gravity still apply, the game would be impacted by factors like increased air resistance and structural strength of materials. A football designed proportionally larger to match the giants would experience different aerodynamics due to its size, 
Despite these changes, the fundamental principles of physics, such as Newtonian's laws, still predict the movement of the ball and players correctly. This demonstrates how physical laws are consistent across scales in theory. Now, imagine we could shrink this football field, players, and ball to the size of ends. I mean, measuring the size of the players would be no problem, and physics would behave the same. But if we keep on going down to the quantum scale, measuring the player's exact size or position becomes problematic due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which states that the more precisely the position of some particle is determined, the less precisely its momentum can be known, and vice versa. This quantum effect doesn't significantly impact the players in the original size, but dictates the behavior of microscopic particles like electrons. Here, while the concepts of distance and position are crucial for both scenarios, the impact and interpretation of measuring these distances differ drastically due to the different physical laws that dominate at varying scales. This example shows how both absolute and relative measurements are context-dependent, with quantum mechanics introducing a probabilistic nature not seen in classical mechanics at larger scales. In simple terms, measurements such as the meter, which is defined based on the distance light travels in a vacuum over a fraction of a second, are not inherent properties of objects, but are rather conventions based on human-defined scales. These units are crucial for consistency in scientific experiments, though they are based on arbitrary choices. The application of physical laws appears consistent at human scales, but varies significantly under extreme conditions. We therefore say that general relativity and classical physics are scale invariant, but quantum mechanics is not. This is an important consideration, because a unified theory, as string theory aspires to be, will have to incorporate this disagreement between these two theories in a harmonic way, which is a big challenge. The basic concepts of string theory are very interesting and appealing, but a true physicist would say, show me the proof, show me the experimental results, what predictions can this crazy theory make? Often, string theorists would reply that their theory makes one prediction that is put to test every single day. What goes up must come down. It predicts the existence of gravity. In fact, it might be the only theory in which the equations of gravity naturally falls into our laps, as string theorists often say. Particle physics treats particles as points in space. If you zoom in on a particle, it still looks just as small as when you started. But string theory disagrees. It says that if you zoom really, really far into a particle, you will eventually see a tiny little strand of a vibrating string. The building blocks of the universe are treated as strands, not dots. If we place a particle in a space with three axes, such that one of them is time and the others make up a two-dimensional space, we would notice that the particle moves forward in time, even when it's sitting still in space. We often imagine time as another dimension, just like the three that make up space. Bundling time with our three dimensions of space results in a four-dimensional space-time. This coordinate system is what is called a space-time diagram. An electron traces out a vertical line as time ticks forward, supposing it is still. For example, this line is called the electron's world line, so called because it represents the entirety of the electron's lifespan. These world lines represent everything that a particle has done and will do throughout its entire existence. Now, how would a string theorist describe the same scenario? First of all, the particle is not a dot anymore, but a string. In the simplest case, a string looks like a closed loop a rubber band. This loop of string also moves through time, just like a particle. And in doing so, rather than tracing out a line, it traces out a big hollow tube. The area of the surface of this tube is what's called action in physics, or the integral over the time of the Lagrangian in mathematics. Don't worry about these terms. Also, you can easily see that an open string, or like a broken rubber band, will trace out a strip instead. If you take the string along some wild path, the area of the world sheet becomes large. Meanwhile, if we take it on a direct path between two points, the area of the world sheet is small. The shortest path is the one that results in the world sheet with the smallest area possible. In other words, this is the path chosen by nature, the one that minimizes the action also called the geodesics of the particle. Therefore, we need a way to measure things here if we want to calculate the area. But remember how complicated the concept of measurement is. In general relativity, we measure distances with something called the metric tensor, or simply the metric of space-time. Calculating the shortest path or smallest area in practice is hard. 
So what we need to do is to change the rules slightly to make it easier to work with. The way we do this is to allow ourselves the freedom to change how we measure areas on the world sheet. Usually we think of areas as being measured with a ruler. You measure the length and the height of something, multiply those two numbers together and that gives you the area. This is no different on the world sheet. You need a ruler to measure the area. This ruler is usually given to us by the metric of the background coordinates of space-time in which the string moves. Those axes on the space-time diagram dictate the rulers that we use. But this way we have no freedom on how we measure the area. What we actually want, though, is not to use the rulers given to us by space-time. We want to play with our own toys. So instead of using the correct rulers, the one given by space-time, we just pick our own, which might be stretched or warped to be any length we like. Of course, the goal of doing this is to simplify the calculations. In the next video, we're going to see exactly how to use those fake rulers to build string theory from scratch. This was part one. Stay tuned for part two that will come soon. This series was inspired by the article that will be linked below in the description. See you in the next video.